I'm Nicholas Sperling. I'm joined by Hunter Madsen and Benjamin Perry, uh, candidates for Port Moody Council and Coquitlam Council, respectively, and this is Tri-Cities Community TV. This is going to be a conversation about developer donations, and I wrote about this in 2018 when I looked into donations that had been made to council candidates, and at the time we were looking at a previous election before campaign finance reform had been introduced by the province. So now that campaign finance contributions have been limited to individuals as opposed to corporations and unions, the idea is that that's supposed to take away some of that perceived influence that those donations can have over candidates. But what we're finding, or what your research, Hunter and, and Ben, has uh, dug up, is that that may not actually be the case. So, Hunter, can you maybe talk about what got you interested in this issue uh, and what you found through your research? Uh, sure. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm a politician now, but previously um, I was a social scientist uh, uh, doing work uh, in influence theory uh, back at, at Harvard. I have a doctorate in it. And so I've always been tracking this, in for this sort of area for a while. And when I got into politics, I was interested to observe um, uh, some basic things going on in the influence uh, of people at the council table that gave me some concern. And the, the, the principal concern is uh, around campaign donations. Campaign donations um, work the way any nice thing somebody does for you um, works. When, when people do kindnesses for you or show that they like you um, or support your candidacy, um, <clears throat> it is uh, a natural evolved instinct for all humans. It's, it's just not something we have much control over. It's hardwired into us to, uh, to feel two things. First of all, gratitude, to like them better. But the other is a kind of uncomfortable feeling of obligation to them. You're indebted to them or you're beholden to them. And uh, in the political world, um, it's, uh, that is much of what drives the, 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 the political scene. Uh, there was a, a fixer for uh, President McKinley back in the Gilded Age in the U.S. who once quipped, he was explaining to somebody, he said there are two important things in politics. The first is money, and I can't remember what the second is. And, uh, you know, the, the reason why that everybody, everybody in politics laughs at that joke because uh, money enables candidates to run and gives them access to media, um, but in exchange for that, it, uh, the money they've taken gives other people access to them. So this is a study that sort of dove deeper into what's been going on since the 2017 ban that the province had on all corporate and union donations to uh, municipal candidates. You know, and basically what the study found is um, that, well, there's an old saying that uh, money in politics is like ants in the kitchen. Um, you know, unless you block every possible way, money will find a way in. And once it does, it ends up starting to corrupt everything, corrupt decision making, corrupt thinking. Um, and so that ban in 2017 uh, by the province was well intended and it's helped to an extent. But there are a lot of ants still in the kitchen because they discovered they could take their money instead of calling it corporate, they could call it individual. They get divided up into more uh, candidate donor recipients um, and be very present and influential across a bunch of cities. So that's still going on, and the principal parties engaged in it are in the development community, which is the wealthiest, most powerful sector of the uh, British Columbia economy. Right, so developers are what you've noticed as being the most influential within those those Correct. Donations and that this is, it's not just developers who do this. I mean, anybody who's giving money uh, at campaign time, if, if they're a business, they may have a vested interest in incurring favor because they may have something they want from a politician down the road. For the most part, it's not the case. They don't have anything specific. They just want to be engaged in politics and, and support their candidate. Um, <clears throat> but there are some sectors that sort of make a practice of creating uh, networks of indebted people or beholden people. And I think if you look at the data for the real estate development industry in British Columbia, um, they use campaign donations strategically. To they, they ask, hmm, where do we have a big project coming up? In which city? And let's make sure we give money to everybody on the council so everybody likes us <laughs> when that uh, proposal comes up.
Right, because th there must be some benefit that developers are seeing, otherwise they wouldn't be making those donations in the first These place. These are business right? investments for them by and large. And that's, that's one of the tricky things about this situation with individual donations. If you look at, um, uh, well, I, I looked at a couple uh, developers, I don't even know if I want to, to name them here because they're not particularly unusual, but I, I examined a couple of big developers and their patterns. And before the, the ban you've described from 2017, um, they're giving money directly under the names of the corporations to all these, um, all these council members all in, in many different cities where they're doing business. The minute the ban came in, of course, all the corporate giving stopped, and suddenly the, uh, you know, the, the owner of the, co of the development company, the wife, the daughter, the dog, everybody's giving money um, on an individual basis to the same players that were getting it from the corporation before. This looks like just a change of, of channel for what is the same strategy. Right, right. Um, and Ben, you saw Hunter's research, from what I understand, and you started doing your own research into Coquitlam, is that right? That's right. Uh, so what did you find through that research? Well, the first thing I found is it's not too difficult to trace this down. So um, Hunter was rigorous and careful and produced a proper paper. I did something a little quicker and dirtier. I just used, did a little bit of Google searching. I set my bar at donations of a thousand or more to sort of flag things. Um, and in about a matter of two hours, I was able to find uh, $50,000 of donations that I believe, and I could be wrong about some of them, but I think, I think I'm not, about $50,000 of donations at least that were from um, people in top executive positions or family members of development corporations in Coquitlam. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and why is it such an issue for candidates to accept these kinds of donations, or is it an issue for them to accept them? It sounds like what you've mentioned around that um, influence piece is, is probably the biggest issue at play. It's legal, it's perfectly legal under the laws today for uh, developers or any business person uh, seeking to curry favor to give money to candidates. And there, from their point of view, there's nothing wrong with that. If I was a business person and, it, and this was a channel that was permitted, I might well be doing that as well. The question is an ethical one for the candidates. Any candidate can take this money as long as it's all legal, lawfully given. It's not a question of legal wrongdoing. It's a question of eth ethical judgment um, uh, and, and whether it's the right thing to be doing. If you know that taking this money is likely to make you more vulnerable to pressure and influence later, and that your first concern is the public interest, you, you know, that is your job to simply serve the highest public interest. Taking some of this money creates dual loyalties or divided loyalties. And, and it's your judgment call as a politician, as an official, uh, whether you want to do that. It is your public's judgment call whether they agree with the decision you've made. Mm -hmm. um, if you feel like you need to hide the fact that you've been taking this money from business people, that may be a little clue to you that um, there may be something ethical, ethically questionable about it, and that the public may not agree with you. And the public's ethics are what get to decide. Right. So we're not talking about issues of illegal activity. We're talking about issues of potentially unethical activity. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and the, the judgment. I, um, small children think that, uh, that it, you know right from wrong, depending on whether or not you'll get caught and punished for it. But grown-ups know there are a lot of things you can do in the world that are that you can get away with legally, but they're not ethically the right things. They're not, they're not the thing you should be doing if you're thinking of your broader responsibilities. And that's, I think, the place in which these issues about taking campaign donations from developers or bringing requests to your council, that's where I think um, we need to surface, we need to spotlight what's going on and let the public decide if they think that's that's okay or not. There is sort of an, uh, like if you're talking about ethics, part of our system's competitive. So there's like an ethical component of competition. So it's not really fair at this point to single out candidates who've taken this money. They've all taken it and it's, if they weren't to take it, it would disadvantage them and they may be the best for the public interest. So they needed to compete with the other, other players. So I think at this point, I would, pref I would prefer that we just find a way to not have it happen again and let people know that it has been happening 
and make sure that the next election is an even more like an election where the candidates are representing not just as their first concern but their only concern the public interest mm -hmm. and i think that's where where we need to go with this next. well you know i agree with you i think that uh, ultimately it's not the candidate's fault that the whole system is set up to push them into taking money from what are principally business people in the in the, their environment i mean it's set up especially in more expensive uh, cities it some cities are more expensive to run in run a candidacy in than others it's not very expensive in my little city of port moody but um you know they can be hundred thousand plus campaigns for candidates in say vancouver those people need that money to just to run so what is the answer there well really the ultimate answer um is what governments around the world have started to do i said some 40 percent of countries around the world have had such a problem with undue influence coming from campaign money that they've done campaign finance reform they've put in rules like uh the provinces about corporations and um uh, unions not giving money but a lot of them are also saying we will pick up the tab for all qualified candidates to cover the costs or a big chunk of the costs of their running. So they don't, they're not under such pressure to just say yes to the money that's being handed to them. Right, and we have noticed that issue in Vancouver recently in the news with uh, Kennedy Stewart's list of people that he wanted to contact for donations. It's, it's an amazing list because, uh, not because when, you know, these things are rare, but because of course it got out to the, to, to the public, mm -hmm. um, you know, but these are sitting around the table and saying, we got to raise this much. For t we have a TV budget. We got a print budget. Here's, here's how, how do we make this money? Who do we go talk to? And, and why is it that it's not getting out to the public? Like why, why are we not seeing a lot of media articles about developer donations to candidates? I, I should say, I, this is on my blog and I, this isn't just a plug for my blog. I contacted, um, the two local, periodical newspapers in Tri-Cities recently, um, they said they'd be interested. So I don't know if they didn't know about it, but you were in the Vancouver Sun, and when I talked to them, they hadn't actually heard about your story. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's no interest. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, that's not true for everybody. Um, when uh, I finished the report, I sent it to the uh, chief uh, editor-in-chief of the Vancouver Sun, who is a, is a great, his name is Harold Monroe, he's a great reporter for The Sun for many years. And um, he read the report and he said, actually, I know something about this area and I used to report on it. And in fact, we have uh, uh, writers who really focus on, on this, like Dan Fumano, um, uh, but, but even, uh, even the writer that uh, covered my story. You know, she was very, very interested. So the press knows this is going on um, and they're concerned. Um, Martin Brown, I mentioned Martin Brown in, in the report. Martin Brown was the um, chief of staff for Gordon Campbell. Um, Gordon Campbell was uh, for many years a mayor in Vancouver and after that for, um, three terms as premier for the province. Um, and Martin wrote this piece for the Strait when he left um, government. He retired, he said, I gotta say, you know, what's going on is legal, and I never really had um, a developer come in crassly, say, I'll give you this money if you'll do that. It never do works like that. But he said that it, it, what's, it's not what's legally concerns him, it's, it's what's ethical, and that, that under this, in this climate, it's just too easy to become cozy with uh, companies that really, really want you to say yes to things. Um, and you develop a personal relationship, they're nice people, and they have access. Um, and it does sort of change your thinking, even Martin said. You sort of start to think of them in collaborative terms, um, in how do, how do we get you what you need and want, we want to make it right for you, and you know, it's, a, it, it's all with good intentions, positive intentions. Um, so, but anyway, they, to go back to your, the press, the press is, is somewhat interested, uh, but it is kind of a powder keg. Uh, in a province that's run by this money. Um, the Sun looked at who was giving money, who were the principal donors in the province uh, to, to candidates back in 2014 and 2018. And the list is, depending on your view, shocking or not. It's like 
all the big families, all the big developers, the big names of the co development companies, they dominate. 21 of the, of the top 50 donors, I think it was in the 2014 uh, election, were um, well-known figures in the development community. You know, so, so the press does care. They're tracking it, but not many people sort of dare to bring it up as an issue. Uh, you know, I, we, uh, Ben and I have been talking to other concerned candidates. Um, I, by the way, I've been contacted by ex-politicians after that article. I, I got called by a mayor from Surrey, a former mayor of said, said, you're right on, this is a big, big problem, but he's been out of the politics for years, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but the, the press is concerned, but it's hard to know how to go at this. And uh, it's hard to find um, candidates who have not already found themselves saying yes or wanting to say yes. Uh, and as far as solutions, I know that you've proposed a code of conduct in Port Moody. Can you explain what you're hoping to accomplish with that? And then could both of you uh, explain if that's still something that you're interested in, or, or Ben, if, if that's something that you're hoping to uh, see here in Coquitlam as well? Yeah. Uh, simply, um, if we, you know, it'll be a long time before we get public campaign finance, right? <clears throat> and the laws are what they are. The, the students of corruption basically say the best way to handle corruption of this sort, which is favoritism or bias, so it's really hard to get that through the courts and have the courts really uh, make the laws on undue influence stick. So the, be the best way to do it in a democratic system is to use democratic means. And that is making sure the public has complete visibility as to what money you've taken, from who you've taken it, and then when you're at the council table, say you're elected as a councillor, um, what this new code of conduct for our uh, council now will call for, and by the way, it was unanimously adopted when this came up, um, is that when a given developer's business is before council, um, the chair of the meeting says to every participant, has anyone here, does anyone here have anything to declare about a connection, a personal, some, you may have taken money from somebody associated with this developer. If so, just tell us who and what uh, before, before we start. We also encourage people in that case to recuse themselves, but you can't require that legally. But what you set the norm that in these cases we basically recuse. So why is that so useful? Well, it's not so much about the recusal. It's that even if you didn't leave the room and you participated in the vote, you know, the public watching knows, and the counselors all know that this is very much in the air as a possible influence factor. It will make you as a counselor, if I've taken money, it will make me doubly careful to keep focus on the public interest and to not, you know, to be, I'd be doubly, I might e even overcorrect in, in terms of um, how responsible I was. So I, I think getting that norm in place and city council after city council is very healthy. If you can't change the laws, you can't do public campaign finance, then, um, then people should acknowledge their indebtedness before they go into making decisions on behalf of the public. They have personal indebtedness when they're their role is one in representing the public. So that just needs to be called out. It's not shaming. It needs to become a matter of regular practice because a lot of, po many, many, many politicians have taken business money and it just, it, it, it should become almost a matter of fact thing at the beginning of every meeting. People say, yes, I did this, I did that. Um, I am going to recuse. I'm not going to recuse because, because this reason, fine. Just, mm -hmm. It's transparency that's key. Right. Yeah, I was going to say transparency sounds like the, the ultimate goal here as a way of holding everyone accountable exactly. for their actions. Exactly. Um, so is this something that you're hoping to see in Coquitlam as well, Ben? Yeah, I would love to see this influence made aware of, people made aware of, the public, and I'd, I'd just like to see the influence removed. Um, I think if we have council shift um, so that there's no risk of this undue influence, and I'd like to see what happens to our, our policy around development housing um, because I think if, if there is potentially this representation of these for-profit businesses, then that could have an influence on housing prices.
And I think if we need affordable housing, we want counselors that are representing the voting public, the residents, the people who need the housing, rather than the people who are trying to make money off the business. And there's a potential risk that that's what's going on right here with this with these donations. I'm not saying there is, but it, there's the chance that that's going on, and we we won't know till we mm-hmm. till we get that money out of the equation. Right, and to give folks a sense of sort of what that influence looks like, are there some big players that are um, that you can talk about uh, well, locally? I can, I can say in Coquitlam, um, we can talk about the big names in Coquitlam, Marcon. BD, Westfield, uh, there's a, a developer on Brook Mountain named Nura Homes that does uh, luxury homes up there. These are all big, these are all people I found lots of money from their executive, their CEO, their vice president, family members. Mm-hmm. Um, and are there any currently elected officials in either of your cities that have either taken a vow to not accept developer donations because of that perceived influence or who have taken it upon themselves to just declare that they're accepting them, even though they're not necessarily required to do that? Well, um, I should let Hunter go. You go first. Okay. <laughs> in, in Coquitlam, my my analysis, I didn't find um, any donations to Benita Zarillo's campaign or Chris Wilson's. And then Hunter let me know when I reported that mm-hmm. to him that uh, maybe he's found a little bit in Chris Wilson's. But those were the two I found who hadn't. Otherwise. It was everybody on council, and I guess that maybe I didn't catch everything. So, mm-hmm. I think this may be in transition. Um, uh, you know, as we uh, as we organize to raise public and media awareness about this form of corruption, it's a form of corruption called undue influence. Uh, as we as people start to become more sensitized to it, we're going to find uh, more and more candidates um, find, finding it in their interest to say, you know. Um, it's an area that people don't feel comfortable with, so um, they're just declaring they're not going to take certain kinds of do- donations. In Port Moody, um, uh, the mayoral candidate, Steve Milani, um, has, uh, whose brother's a, a, a low-key developer and gave him a little bit of money last time, but he's just said from now on he's not taking any developer money for this candidacy. Um, the um, same, th- same thing is true for me. I didn't take any money in 2018 because I, I always sensed um, sensitivities around this. Um, uh, David Stewart is a candidate in Port Moody who was declared, he's the uh, uh, city manager actually for District North, um, North Vancouver, who is also running uh, for a council position. And he has, um, he's declared he's not going to be taking any developer money. He knows that world very well. Um, Haven Lerbecki has declared she's not going to take any campaign money, period. Now, this is very different, and you can almost see the two camps emerging in, uh, for example, for Moody politics. When I did this study, I said, right, pull, pulled this out because I thought we might, you don't, your camera will be able to see this. I, th- I think we're actually getting pretty close to what, when we need to wrap up, if oh, I okay. understand correctly here. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, yes, we are. Um, yeah, if, when I did the study, I discovered you could divide the candidates sort of into two groups. The newest, inco- the newest candidates had taken very little money uh, from developers bringing business to the city. The longtime incumbent, the incumbents, in this case, Dilworth, Megan Lottie was running for mayor, um, Zoe Royer, um, and then incumbent Mayor Mike Clay, had all taken pri- most of their money for their campaign, primarily from the developers who were bringing business to the city. So it was like 55% for Dilworth, 61% for Lottie, 70% for Wire, 74% for Mike Clay. So clearly we have sort of two approaches, two, two camps as to whether it's okay or not okay to be taking this money and to building your political career um, around those interests. I think there's a new movement afoot to stop taking that money and to just focus on the public interest and those mm-hmm. special interests. Well, Thank you both for raising this really important issue. Uh, This has been a conversation about developer donations with Hunter Madsen and Benjamin Perry. And this has been Tri-Cities Community TV. I'm Nicholas Sperling. I'll see you next time. Thanks, Nicholas. (laughs) Thanks, Nicholas.